So let me start uh, from the beginning. I was born in the Ukraine in uh, 1986 in a small town, not so conveniently located, only 300 miles away from Chernobyl. I decided to start with this photo because in Ukraine there's a superstition that if your baby is born very sick and ill, you don't take photos of the baby. On the 26th of April 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, causing the largest in history nuclear disaster in terms of cost and casualties. I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of the explosion. One day, my mother approached my crib. She looked down at me, and I was pale and blue and not breathing. I had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. My mother ran to my dad hysterically, and she was, oh my god, like, oh my god, my baby is dead. What do I do? And my dad shook her physically, and he said, you're a nurse. Do something. <laughs> then she remembered she's a nurse. <laughs> and she gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came and actually saved my life. So I got a second chance in life. I never remembered it, I was a baby, but when I was four years old, my family immigrated to Israel, to a small, small town in the north of Israel called Akko. Every time we had a family meetup or gathering, everybody from my family would say like, wow, that's so cool, you got a second chance in life. And I was like, wow, it is cool. I should really do something good with it. Uh, so when growing up, being from a small, city, you don't have really a lot of chance to make a positive impact. So I was thinking, like, how can I really make a change in the world? So growing up, I enrolled to Haifa University, which is a university in the north of Israel, studying political science with the hope of becoming this great politician that will make peace in the Middle East. That, that didn't work out for me. <laughs> Not right now, at least. And uh, when I finished my studies, I was very surprised to find out that there was no lineup of politicians waiting to hire a young lady straight from university. So I went to work as an English Hebrew translator at a renewable energy company. And whereas that renewable energy company was not necessarily my cup of tea, I did discover there the whole amazing world of renewable energy. And whereas I saw that solar energy and wind energy were packed with competition, they were great, but there was not too much to innovate, I also discovered wave energy. And wave energy really caught my attention. I found out that wave energy, as opposed to other renewable energy sources, can produce electricity 24-7. It also has 832 times the kinetic energy of air meaning we can produce much larger energy amounts with much smaller, thus cheaper, devices. Here in the United States alone, wave energy can produce 66% of all the United States energy needs. For comparison, right now the United States produces only 20% of its electricity from clean energy sources. And the biggest thing about wave energy, that according to the World Energy Council, it can actually generate twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. Now that's a game changer. So then I started researching, if wave energy is that great, why don't we see wave energy everywhere? Uh, and then I discovered that all the developers of wave energy, at least 99% of them, decided to do it that way. Basically, they decided to take these bulk huge floaters and install them in the offshore, four or five kilometers into the sea. And they put all their expensive equipment inside the floaters, the generators, the automation system. And what happened is this device that was meant, it's a company called Pelamis, it was meant to serve 100 households, was built for a development cost of $150 million. Now, I don't know about your electricity bills, but I'm sure it's not 150. Still, investors decided to go ahead and invest in offshore wave energy. They said it starts expensive, and with the time, the price will go down. It never got the chance to go down. Pelamis broke down after three days of operation on the coastline of Portugal. Total loss to the system. So it was expensive. It was breaking down. Insurance companies didn't want to insure these technologies, rightfully so. Uh, environmentalists, which were supposed to be the greatest supporters and proponents of wave energy, were actually objecting this type of wave energy because it created a new presence on the ocean floor and disturbed the environment. And it was very, very expensive to connect it to the electrical grid since it's that far into the ocean. So I started thinking of my own ideas and concept of how to make wave energy in a completely different way. 
And I researched day and night, and I came up with my own concepts. But I didn't have the money, I didn't have the contacts, and I didn't have the technological background. A great start for an entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> so I kind of put my idea aside as not realistic. Then one day I went to a social event, and I met the guy on the photo. This is David Lebb. He's a serial entrepreneur. He came, he sat next to me. I didn't know who he was. And he asked me, what's your passion? And I said, wave energy. And it turned out that he's also very passionate about renewable energy. And he ended up investing the first $1 million into my idea. And that was the beginning of EcoWave Power. So how does our technology work? What is different? As you can see here, we don't go into the offshore. We connect to existent man-made structures, such as piers, breakwaters, jetties, and other types of existent man-made structures. We don't connect to the seabed. We don't connect, create any new presence on the ocean floor. The only thing in the water are the floaters. Floaters belong in the water. And all the expensive machinery is on land, just like a regular power station. So here we can see an uh, explanation how it works. As I said, we connect to existent man-made structures. The floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves, pushing the hydraulic cylinder, which transmits biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. The pressure is turning the hydromotor, turning a generator, sending clean electricity into the grid. This is a power station we built in Gibraltar the same size as the Pelamis one that we saw earlier on. This cost us only $450,000 in development cost. In comparison to the $150 million, this is a big game changer. As you can see in the video in the bottom of the screen, when the waves are too high for the system to handle, our floaters automatically go up above the water level and they stay in the upward position. When the storm passes, they go back into the water and commence operation. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of our technology is also in the fact that uh, we always have a nearby grid connection point to our conversion mechanism. Ports are high consumers of electricity. Municipalities are high consumers of electricity. So once we're connecting to existing structures, we always have a few hundred meters of a grid connection point, which saves a lot of costs that exist right now in solar and wind. We opened the first grid-connected power station in 2016 in Gibraltar. This is our second grid-connected power station, which is now operational in Israel. This is the first time in the history of Israel that wave energy is officially connected to the national electrical grid of the country, meaning people that live in proximity to the port of Jaffa actually can turn on their TV and their washing machine with the power of the waves. And the biggest thing is that the little girl from Akko and the little girl from Ukraine also got the chance to IPO her company on Nasdaq in 2021 under the stock symbol WAVE. So right now we're developing in parallel three power stations. The first one is the one you see on the screen. This is in the port of Los Angeles. We signed a co-investment agreement with Shell. Shell is investing 50% of this project. This is the first time in the history of the United States that wave energy, onshore wave energy, will be officially working at one of the ports in the United States. Here you can also see ex-governor Schwarzenegger, who came to visit the power station upon its arrival to site. He promised that he will be back to the actual <laughs> opening. <laughs> in, in October this year, we also signed an agreement for our first Asian project, which will be in Taiwan. And the project that I'm personally most excited about is the first commercial project that we're building in Portugal. Here you can see an illustration of the project. What's very exciting in this project is that it will be EcoWave Power's first commercial scale wave energy installation, and actually the first commercial scale wave energy in the world. That's a huge breakthrough for wave energy. We will show that we are not only cost efficient and reliable, but we can also be profitable and produce large amounts of electricity, even more than wind and solar. EcoWave Power has a project pipeline of 404.7 megawatt all around the world, and we keep growing. And I would like to finish my talk with the two calls for action. One is regarding this guy. Uh, this is Pierre Simon Girard. He's the person, the engineer from France, that registered the first ever patent for wave energy in 1799. This is 225 years ago. 
So my first call to action for you, don't let another 225 years pass before wave energy is implemented. Support wave energy, research wave energy, because it can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. And my second call to action is more on a personal note. Uh, as I said, I opened, I established EcoWave Power when I was 24. I didn't have the money, I didn't have the contacts, and I didn't have the technical background. I still made it happen. So please remember that passion is the greatest renewable energy source, even stronger than the power of the waves. Thank you. Thank you.